Welcome. My name is Naveen Kishore and I'm the publisher at Seagull Books. Um, it is my pleasant duty to welcome our conversationalist today. I am a Jew who was born and who grew up in a Catholic country. I never had a religious education. My Jewish identity is in large measure the result of persecution, Carlo Ginsberg. Professor Ginsberg was born in 39 in Turin, Italy, the year the Nazis marched into the streets of Vienna. His father, the literary critic, translator, and publisher, dissident Leon Ginsberg, was born in Odessa in 1909 and left Russia as a young man after the Russian Revolution, moving first to Berlin and finally settling in Turin. Professor Ginsberg's mother, the author, critic, and editor, Natalia Ginsberg, was born in Palermo, Sicily, to a Jewish father and a Catholic mother. In 1938, Mussolini's fascist regime published the Manifesto of Race, revoking citizenship for Italian Jews, and with it, stripping them of their professions and any position in the government. Although I was raised without religion, says Carlo Ginsberg, According to the Italian racial laws, I was born a Jew, and so I was given an identity. Paul Holden Grabber, erstwhile director of the New York Public Library's outreach program, once asked Professor Ginsberg to describe himself in seven words, a question he asks each of his guests in lieu of their biographies, numerous awards, books, and honors. A haiku of sorts, says Paul. The words and one set of numbers Professor Ginsberg chose were straightforward. Carlo Ginsberg, 1939, historian, lives in Bologna. Hartosh Singh Bal, political editor of the Caravan, dear friend and a human being known for his quiet ability to stand up and be counted. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Ginsberg and Hartosh Bal. Today, how would you approach a description of the term microhistory? Okay. Um, first of all, I should focus on uh, the prefix micro. Um, there has been a misunderstanding about uh, the meaning of this uh, uh, prefix, um, as if uh, microhistory would deal with um, topics which would be marginal, small, either symbolically or literally. Now, this is something which is uh, completely different from uh, microhistory as a project, which actually focused on analysis. So microhistory looks at topics as if they were put under the lens of a microscope. That's the meaning. So actually, uh, I was responsible with my friend uh, uh, Giovanni Levi um, of a series published by Einaudi, the uh, Italian publisher, which was called the Micro Story and Micro Histories. And the first book um, in that series was a book of mine called the Indagini su Piero. Uh, the English translation was the Enigma of Piero, or Piero della Francesca, one of the greatest uh, painters uh, in the history of painting. So uh, the idea was to approach this great painter um, through, uh, from a specific angle. It was an analytic book, but certainly the topic was not small in any sense. So, and you say this yourself, that you were doing microhistory before the term was coined. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, my book, The Cheese and the Worms, uh, The Cosmos of a 16th Century Mila, um, was published in 1976 in Italian, then translated into many languages. But uh, that was before the emergence of a debate around uh, the notion of microhistory, which was started by a group of Italian historians uh, connected to a historical journal, Quaderni Storici, uh, uh, other, I mean, contributors to the, this debate were uh, Eduardo Grandi, uh, who died some years ago, Giovanni Levi, uh, Carlo Poni, who also died recently, myself. So there was a debate, and the 
word microanalysis and then microhistory emerged. My book has been regarded as an example of microhistory, let's say, before uh, the emergence of the term. Uh, I focused on a single individual, but uh, in fact, uh, um, that analysis um, intersected with uh, larger issues. Uh, first of all, how did this Miller read his books? Because he read books. Um, I worked on uh, inquisitorial records. Uh, there were two trials against him. Ultimately, he was put to death at the end of the uh, 16th century. And um, he made references to books. I was surprised in seeing uh, how many books he read, in fact. Uh, um, uh, and I tried to identify the books he referred to, and I was able to compare, let's say, the written page, the printed page, with what he said about that. There was a gap, and I interpreted the gap as a, uh, the result of the outcome of a clash between a basically oral culture, which was uh, Menocchio, that was the name of the Miller, Menocchio's culture originally, and the impact of the printed book. Now, this is a much larger phenomenon. It was not related only to the village in which Menocchio lived. And actually, when I tried to uh, explain to myself the resonance of this book, I must confess, uh, it has been translated into 26 languages, that's surprising, and my first answer is, well, first of all, because uh, Menocchio was such a powerful personality, so I was simply conveying what he said, you have extensive quotations of his thoughts, starting from the title, The Cheese and the Worms, which is a reference to what he said about uh, the emergence of the world, the emergence of life from rotten matter, uh, something comparable to worms emerging from uh, a rotten cheese. And he said, uh, like worms emerging from a rotten cheese, the angels emerged in order to help God. So, I mean, a very unconventional cosmogony, we could say. Now, if I ask myself uh, why there was this, uh, I mean, is Menocchio's words uh, had such a reception through my, my, my work as a transcriber and interpreter, I would say there were two elements which were shared by, are shared by <laughs> possibly, uh, well, most uh, cultures and, uh, and societies. First of all, Menocchio's challenge to authorities, both secular and, uh, and religious. On the other hand, the intersection I was mentioning before between oral culture and written culture, and printed culture.